jungle, you met the enemy eyeball to eyeball. What was that experience like? I think it was very interesting. First of all, because it was the first time that a president met with directly with the leader of the of the FARC. Um, and I think it was a great experience, first of all, because I think it was the first step in which we show our commitment to achieve peace. And I think from, from, from that moment, from that starting point, we create the conflict between the leader of the FARC, Marulanda, and myself. And I think that's what uh, has maintained the process in more than one year, as you said, in which we are committed to try to achieve peace. I think that uh, sometimes even they didn't thought that I was going to be there. And I remember uh, some of the guerrillas around, because I went without my security, I went alone, only with my High Commissioner for Peace. And even the guerrilla were asking, is that guy sitting there really the President of Colombia, or the elected President of Colombia? And I think it gave them also like a, a signal that really we want peace and that we were willing and committed to work for, for peace as we've been working in, in the last year and a half. But these people are killing your policemen, yes. killing your soldiers. How did that make you feel to shake hands with this man who's been responsible for decades for this? I think that's, that's something that you always are like uh, saying, OK, what's happening? But I think even that we have this internal war, this uh, internal conflict, because even sometimes uh, people talk about a civil war in Colombia, and that's not true. We don't have a civil war. You, you've been here for two weeks, and have you seen that there's 30,000 men against 40 million Colombians? A civil war is between two fractions, a country divided into fractions. Here we have 30,000 men. If you sum the men in the different guerrilla or insurgent groups against 40 million Colombians, and it, it, that's difficult to go and see that these people have been in war for 40 years, that since I was born you were hearing about them. But I think sometimes you have to take those steps. And it's difficult. And I think that's, that's what is happening in Colombia. And you could feel it also, for example, in, in the peace process in Northern Ireland, that they sign an agreement and next day a car bomb or uh, they, they go in the streets and, and kill people. It's difficult, but, but sometimes you have to put all your efforts to try really to achieve peace, and that's where we're working for. But it's difficult sometimes to meet with them and know that these guys are the ones that are killing our soldiers, our policemen, civilians. But I think we need to work, uh, uh, and that's why uh, uh, internally you say for yourself, we have to achieve peace in this country. Do you think you went too far in uh, I think also there's some misinformation there because as you know, the, the first thing I have to respect is the Colombian law and the Constitution. And the first thing I have to respect is the integrity of my territory. So I don't think that we went far in, in trying to, to create an environment to start a, a dialogue between the park. We didn't give this land to the park. The Colombian rule is there. You have the mayors. You could speak with the mayors there. You could speak to the members of the city council. And I have the authority that in any moment that they violate the Colombian law, I could finish the distinction zone. So, uh, so that's something that it's not true. But I went to San Vicente. The mayor had fled. There are no, far guerrillas no, no, carrying no, but, guns. No, but different reasons. No, I think that things change there. If you go there, it, it, and if you go to the meetings with the FARC and the people, they are very tough with the FARC for the first time before. The FARC was there and attacked them and ran away. Today, the civilian population stand up and say to them, uh-uh, we don't want you killing us. We want to work. And I think it's the first time that it's, uh, or in the history of Colombia, that you have more presence of the state in this area than before. I understand that sometimes people are saying, OK, 42,000 square kilometers, uh, it's the area of the distension zone. But people don't understand or people don't know that it's that is 0.25%, 0.25% of 1% of the territory of Colombia. As you know, 90,000 people are living in 42,000 square kilometers. And I think what happened there, and you have to see 
Okay, we create a distinction zone that that was an area in which they could be there to start the dialogues with the president or the government. And the result is that today, they are sitting in the table of negotiations. And I think that's something very important because it's the first time in 40 years. We know that we have been, or we have problems inside the area. And that's why the 2nd of May, I went even to talk to my Orlando, to the leader of the FARC. And I said to him, you cannot throw out the priest of the church because you didn't like what he said on Sunday. You, you think that's, that's good for the peace process? We agree that you have to be out of the, of the, of the, of the towns. And, and you, you have to see the, the, the whole thing, not the small things, I said to Maroranda. We have to work together and avoid that small problems, as the one I was telling about the priest, because the priest in a sermon on, on the church on Sunday were against them. They want to throw out the, the, the priest. I said, you think that's good for the process? I don't think that's good for the process. So what happened if they did throw out the priest? No, we have to be real. They didn't throw out the priest because they understood that that's not something that they could do. And that's why I said to think, you don't have to think small things. You have to see all the process and not get in small things. And I think that was very important, that meeting between Arulanda the 2nd of May, because a lot of things. And you have to understand that, that it, this is something new for us, for them and for us. Uh, that we know that uh, what we want to do is create an environment in which, uh, as I said before, we want to sit in a table, see if we could negotiate. And at the end, today, I think they're in the table of negotiation, and they are understanding that they have to respect a lot of things. You have to understand also that these people have been in the mountain for 40 years, and, and they're against the law. They don't respect the law of Colombian law because they don't believe in the Colombian law. And that's why I also said to Marolanda, look, one thing, I am the president of Colombia. And if I am going to do a peace process with the FARC, the first thing that I have to do is respect the Constitution and the law. Otherwise, I'm going to be in jail. Are you and you would not have anybody to talk. And that's, that's why every step in this process we've been doing inside the Constitution and the law. Unfortunately for us, this weekend in the Congress, um, the law, the 418, uh, they extended for three more years. And I think that's going to be very important for the process, or it's going to be very important for the process. Is there pressure from your military commanders who apparently have evidence, and indeed I spoke to one who said that the FARC are using this territory as a base to launch attacks on your soldiers? I said that. I said that to them. I said to the park there. And what did they say back? Huh? And they said, you have to respect, and you have to be aware that, that the, the distinction zone, not even the president, not the people is going to, to do that. If we have real, real evidence that that is happening, as I said to you before, something that you have to understand is that the distinction zone is created by a decree signed by the president. In the first step, we, we give them three months. In the second step, we gave them six months extension, starting the 7th of May. We just signed the one of December, so we go for six more months. But in any time that they violate the Colombian law, I could immediately seize the extension zone. But I hope that, and I think that we're working right now. Unfortunately, unfortunately, and, and you know that you have the same experience in Ireland. Uh, I said to the FARC, why don't we try to do the peace in peace instead of doing the peace in war? Because people don't understand. Because it is war now. Though. That's right. The same thing in Ireland. The same thing. I remember one day they signed an agreement. Next day you have the worst car bomb in the history. People don't understand that. And the same thing is happening in Colombia. You know, I'm sitting at the table of negotiation, my government, and next day they launch an attack to, to uh, three, five, seven municipalities. So people don't understand. They said, OK, we're giving them real signals, commitment that we want peace, and what they're giving us back, death. For example, ceasefire. I asked them, why don't we have a ceasefire for one month, starting 15 of December and ending 15 of January? Why don't we show the world that we want to end the millennium in peace and that we want to start the new millennium in peace? If they refused. What, and what was the result? 146 guerrilla died, 24 soldiers died. 
I said, it was worth to kill almost 200 Colombia because you didn't take the right decision. So what's happening? Inside the extension zone, it's an area in which we come, we, we dialogue, we have our conversations. But outside the distinction zone, unfortunately, we have to, to be in war, and we are in war, unfortunately. The last time a peace process began in 1982 under a predecessor, President uh, Betancourt, what happened to that? Th there were a lot of things that didn't match, because you have the process with Belisario, you have the process then with, the, with Gaviria, that, that they bombed La Uribe. The thing was that they really did not agree in, in an agenda, because they have even a ceasefire at that time, that it was very, very important. Um, we had to, in, in all the, in the different, different parts of the process, because Belisario or Gaviria, I don't want to talk about what, what happened there, but, but I think that the most important thing right now is that we have an agenda that we didn't have before. And we create, uh, uh, the environment to start negotiations because maybe it's something it's, it's important to point out that why the distinction zone because many of the peace processes in the world what happens is that they go outside of the country and maybe it's easier and uh, and more than easier sometimes it's very good for the process because you you have the secrecy uh, you don't have the pressure of the media you don't have the pressure of the public opinion of your country. And as you could see here, you have everyday people want news about peace. And, and, and maybe you know more than, than us managing these type of things. And, and, and it's difficult. You cannot produce a, a, a daily news on, on the peace process. So uh, now I think why, why this process advanced is because, fortunately for us and, and, and for Colombia, uh, after the first step that we plan with the FARC, we have now um, an agenda, 12-point agenda. Uh, we have, uh, and we agree on the, the mythology in which we are going to work, and we hope that very soon we could achieve agreements in some of the points that we had in the agenda. Could I suggest this, sir, that the last time peace talks took place, the problem did not come necessarily from the guerrillas. We're talking about with the M19, with the Union Patriotica. Yes. We're talking about other forces in this society that actually opposed the granting of concessions. Certain forces, however you wish to call them, paramilitaries, came out and opposed it. Why should that not happen again once you have to make real concessions to meet some of the FARC's demands? OK, I think that two things, right? that, that it's important, M19. We could achieve a peace process, fortunately, and now they're in, in democracy and working very hard. And you have them in the Senate and in the House of Representatives and city councils and as a political party. So I think that's important. What happened with the Union Patriotic was different, and I agree with you. That's because people think, why the FARC? They want to go into, into a peace process. When they might be killed if they were to put down their guns. That's right. That's right. Why, why they want to go? And I, and, and I want to say that the real experience was the Union Patriotica that unfortunately the state didn't give them the real protection and they, and they extinguished, literally, killing more than 4,000 men that were involved in that moment. So that's why we need to give more protection. I think that we need to work more with them because really I'm, I'm not the, 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 the speaker of the FARC, but I think that what they want to go is into, a, into democracy. They want to really be uh, elected. Uh, as mayors and city councils and to the Congress, and, and they want to, to go really in, in this space. I said there is a space in Colombia in which they could occupy, and that's why I think they want to do, and that's why we need to give them protection. Well, who are these paramilitaries? Because there have been many links documented between them and the army. No, now it's, I think, I want to be clear on that, because even if you could see what happened, many of the, of the attacks in which the militaries were in my government, I'm not talking about other governments. In my government, even you remember what happened in La Gavarra. Uh, they were not, even we gave information to them, and they were not uh, uh, reacting to those. I have to see some of the journals saying, look, first of all, there's no, and what the military is doing is, is try to really uh, uh, look forward to, to fighting all 
the violent actors in this process. Call them vigilantes or right winds or paramilitaries, guerrilla, insurgency, all of them. We need to put all the pressure. And that's what, what they're doing, and I think with, with good results. I'm not saying that they may be links between some of the members of the army, because it could be. But I think what we're trying to do is really putting all the pressure also to the paramilitaries in the fight again with the paramilitaries with good results. Not as much as we want, but I think that we've been, uh, and our military, our new, what we call the cupola, our new uh, staff, the, the commanders of the different armed forces, I think they're, they're working very hard on that to try to get rid of that image that sometimes people try to link between paramilitaries and the militaries. How important is American support to this peace plan? <laughs> That's a good question. This is not only American support, and, and, and I thank you for the question. We have a common enemy in this process. That it's drugs. That it's narcotics. Because as you could see, who is financing, or the paramilitaries, or the guerrilla? Narco. Narco traffic. It's drugs. It's drugs. So I think that we have a common enemy here. And that's why uh, I'm promoting what I call the Plan Colombia. That for the first time we have a coherent plan, not only in the military and security, but in justice, social investment, infrastructure, alternative development, fight on drugs. So what we propose is we went to the United Nations and launched the Colombian plan. We went to the US Senate and to the government and launched the Colombian plan. We went to the European Parliament and launched the Colombian plan. And that's why I think this is a war in which we need the support of the whole world, because we have a common enemy that is narco-trafficking. If we defeat narco-trafficking, we are going to defeat all the violent actors that are, are now involved in Colombia, because they don't have the way of financing. And that's why we need to put a lot of pressure in narco-trafficking and, at the same time, in alternative development. But one of the fundamental demands of the FARC is cutting U.S. support. When I saw them in San Vicente, they were, the anger was against U.S. involvement, increasing U.S. involvement here. How can you square those two things? No, no, no. We are going to ask uh, the U.S. and Europe, give us money for social investment, give us money for infrastructure. Maybe that's one of the points we don't agree with the FARC. If the world is willing to give us support in eradicating drugs, we are going to ask them more and more because this is a war in which are, we are committed, and they are committed. That's the most important thing. But, you know, you inaugurated, I think, just a few weeks ago, an anti-guerrilla combat unit at Talameda base. What signal is that giving? That I want to do peace in peace, but I have, I, I've said it. I have a, an army for peace and an army for war. And if they are attacking us, we are going to respond. Because why? I said you starting the interview. I have to respect my constitution and my law. And the, th the first thing I have to do as president of Colombia is protect the life of more than 40 million Colombians. So that's why I, I, I am telling them, why don't we try to do peace in peace? And what, what's happening in the process? Because people are like losing confidence in the process, not because of the government, it's because of the guerrilla. You know, we have given them, even they, they accuse me that I gave 42,000 square kilometers that I, I am giving them all the possibilities to do things, that I am very open to the peace process, that why President Pastrana is uh, giving everything to them, and they haven't given give us, not to me, to Colombia, one gesture in that they will show that they are committed for peace. So that's a problem then? Yes, yes, because what happened? Even I said to Marulanda, that's what is gonna happen in Colombia, that people are losing confidence in the process because you are not giving signals that you want to do peace. When I asked, for example, a ceasefire, what is the answer? Attack the civil society. And I said, all the process, this is not, and I think because sometimes there are good things to compare with other processes, I think people need confidence because what's happening? Colombian is not the government. Colombian is giving them the opportunity to do peace. The government is doing things to create that confidence. The army is giving full support to the government, saying, we are giving you support if you want Mr. President to achieve peace. And the social or the civil society, you saw more than 12 million Colombians saying to the, to the insurgency and to the violence, no more war, 
no more violence, no more kidnappings. And I think what we are expecting, and now I'm talking not as a president, as, as a Colombian, what we are expecting is one gesture of peace, that they are really committed in peace. But that gesture hasn't come, so when, when will your patience run out? No. But, <laughs> you know, you have to have a lot of patience here. Patience and patience and patience. And if you talk about peace, you need more patience than ever, really, to, to achieve peace. Because otherwise, we have to return to the same thing that we had for the last 40 years. That it's war. Because even sometimes, I, I don't know if people are saying here, what is the B plan of Pastrana's government? We don't have a B plan. Or I think that the B plan is what we're doing right now. Because we had an internal conflict for 40 years. We are trying to achieve a peace process. So if we cannot achieve peace in Colombia, we have, we have to return to what we had in the last 40 years. And that's what we don't want. I think that we want to start a new millennium. We want to give our children a different country, a country with peace, with social justice, with respect of the human rights. That's what we want for Colombia, and that's what we're working for. Well, you know, times out through is terrific. I mean, okay. is it? Yeah. I mean, are you happy though? Maybe is that 30 seconds you feel? Or no. Is everyone happy? Do you, do you want to say anymore? Right. There's something that the president normally says in every interview, and that is that. Ah, the military intervention? Military intervention. Something you haven't asked. I don't know if you want that because about it. Yeah. Okay. On the American. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly the whole question of anti-narcotics and anti-guerrilla warfare, the overlap is huge. It seems very much the same thing. And America seems to be getting involved in a war here. First of all, what, uh, what we propose and what we're working is try to really, as you said, to, to split the two, the, the two problems. And that's why we create what we call the anti-narcotics battalion that we are going to specialize. We have right now 1,000 new men of the Army that are prepared to fight narcotics. I explain a little bit. What happened is that Colombia police is the one in charge, for example, of fumigation, eradication. So many times that police is acting against uh, uh, the poppy fields or the coca plantations, they are attacked by insurgent groups. So we need to send support to the, to the police. And, and, and many times we, we don't have at that moment, or, or, or we don't have people specialized in these type of actions. So that's why we ask uh, help of the world. And the US is giving us help in training and supporting this anti-narcotics battalion that is going to be exclusively dedicated to be the support of the police in the fight against drugs. And I think that's something that is going to be very important for us. Secondly, uh, that's the only support we have right now from the United States and the military. Uh, many they people will be fighting FARC, though. Because FARC are doing if the war. parks, if the FARC is the one that attack, definitely they're going to fall apart. If, but are they attacking the paramilitaries? If the paramilitaries are involved also in this type of action, they will attack the paramilitaries. They what what they're going to do is really to support the police, because as I said to you before, many times the, the helicopters are attacked, and they they don't they don't have any uh, support, and that's why we need to send now with them, not only the police but the army to try to eradicate large fields and, and, and poppy fields and coca fields and and that's why that's one of the commitments of my government and that's why we're putting also a lot of pressure in eradication and fumigation but do you understand the concerns in washington oh yes definitely that they will get involved no. in a very they're not, messy war no they're not going to get involved that's why uh, first of all i said because sometimes people have said is the u.s going to intervene in colombia are you president pastrana willing to have a military intervention of the united states i said that will never happen in Colombia while I am president of Colombia. We will not have a military intervention, foreign military intervention. And I don't think even the United States is willing to do that. Uh, uh, I, w I want to point out, in, even in a letter sent by President Clinton the 20th of, uh, of July of this year, he said to me in that letter, the solution for Colombia is not a military solution. It's a political solution. And I think that's, that's something that is very important. And that's why we are working in our Colombian plan. And that's why we're asking the help of the US and the Europeans. And we hope that uh, in the first semester of the next year, we will have a donor's table in Europe with special programs, 
special projects in which we are going to present to the European Union to get resources to eradicate one of the biggest problems that is drugs in this country.